everyone. We have the Christmas Gospel according to St. Luke, and so we, uh, we always like to stand for the reading of the Gospel as we prepare to hear the words or the stories about our Lord. Let's stand together. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, friends. Well, Merry Christmas. Good evening from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. I want uh, to begin uh, about, by quoting from the great musician, theologian, social commentator, and pop star, Bob Dylan, all right? Now, I've never, and Nobel Prize winner, all right? Won the Nobel Prize for literature, and he, he wasn't going to take it, then he accepted it. But anyway, uh, Bob Dylan is, uh, you know, kind of a cultural icon, and in one of my favorite songs called My Back Pages, some young Jim will remember My Back Pages, I bet, he has this great line, I don't know if you can finish this or not, the, the words from the chorus, I was so much older then, but I'm younger than that now, Okay. And then the birds covered that. Come on, some of you who are a bit uh, a, a little bit older remember that. I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. Well, this Christmas, I, I extend an invitation for us to grow young uh, because in order to really hear and understand and appreciate the message, we need to approach it with a kind of a childlike wonder, if you will, not childish. Uh, and the difference, childish is kind of whining. Childlike is wondrous. We're open we're listening, we're kind of uh, aware of something in the universe that we could call magic. The problem is, uh, is that we've become a bit jaded, perhaps, especially if we have a few years upon us, um, you know, uh, and it's old hat. We've heard the story so many times. You know, I Google research this. You know, I didn't realize this. There are 37 million, approximately, congregations in the world, Christian congregations, 37 million, all right? And that means there are that many pastors who are standing up to do what I'm doing, and we've been doing this for 2,000 years. Probably everything that could be said has been said and said better than I can say it. So why should we say anything at all? And it's the complex, uh, uh, to add injury to insult, to make it more difficult, is that uh, we all have questions about the story. As we grow older, how do we really know? that this happened? What kind of proof is there? I mean, after all, we are modern, educated people living in the 21st century where we've got all this technological, these wonders, you know, we're listening to a story that's 2,000 years old about a virgin giving birth. 
about angels appearing, giving a message to a bunch of shepherds, and then disappearing back into heaven? What's the question? I mean, who couldn't accept all of that? But if we're going to understand it, if we're going to get to the kernel, if we're going to get to the heart of the matter, we must grow younger. G.K. Chesterton, um, in his wonderful book called Orthodoxy, now Chesterton was a convert to the Christian faith, a journalist, and he became an apologist for the faith. He became a Roman Catholic Christian and wrote extensively on matters of faith. D died in 1936. In a little book called Orthodoxy, he has a chapter called The Ethics of Elfland. Now, you can't resist talking about Elfland during Christmas, right? And so I went back to that chapter on the ethics of elves, and in this chapter, he draws our attention to the fact that we adults, grown-up, modern people, sophisticated, highly intelligent and educated and all this, we are hard-nosed realists, but we suffer from a fatigue of repetition We've been there, done that. We want something new and innovative. We want proof. We want positivity. But Christmas is a story that baffles us. Familiarity is not so much bred contempt as disinterest. And so what, listen to what Chesterton says. I, I simply love this. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has an eternal appetite of infancy. For we, now listen, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we are. Oh. Yes, that's the problem. We have sinned, and we have grown old. And the older we get, I don't just mean in years, because you can be very young by years and very old in another sense. We've become jaded. We've become closed to wonder and that my friends is a great tragedy we so easily succumb to doubt and despair and unbelief and we're always tempted to become crusty old bitter unbelievers beneath the veneer of faith even the faith we bring with us tonight beneath that surface there's a crusty old sinner and it's always filled with questions, always a little bit uncertain, always old. We've lost our childlike wonder. The world is disenchanted. But the story of Christmas, the story of Christmas, if we really listen to it and are open to it, it has the capacity to re-enchant our lives and our world it's a story that begins, well, it doesn't really begin in Bethlehem. It begins, well, it begins with God. For this was in the mind of God from creation. He was preparing for himself a humanity in which he could take flesh and live among us. When we speak of God, we do so, even in the church so often, about God's doing this, God's doing that, and what do I think about God? Well, what do we mean when we say that word? At the risk of saying something really strange on Christmas, I think when people say God most often, their concept of God is greatly in error and mistaken. We tend to think of God as that supreme being who exists among oh, a whole line of lesser beings, a hierarchy beginning with God at the top and descending through angels and archangels, and then we get down to you and me. The big man in the sky. That's who I believe. I'm counting on the big man in the sky, beard and all. But to paraphrase Frederick Buechner, God is not one real thing among many other real things. God is, now listen, God is that out of which reality itself arises. And to say that he is, as we say we are, is to use language that is at best crudely metaphoric. God is that 
which other which then nothing else can be conceived, as St. Anselm said way back in around the year 1100. God, when we say the word, we should think of sheer mystery and wonder. God is the uncreated one from whom all creation arises and is sustained. The mystic Ma uh, Meister Eckhart said, and I've loved this quote, we all borrow our existence from God. It is God who exists, and if God did not exist, nothing would exist, including you, right here, right now. And to make the idea of God even more amazing, God is not spatial. God does, he is omnipresent, and yet he takes no space. It's like the proverbial ghost in a bathtub. <laughs> you ever heard that analogy? A ghost in the bathtub does not displace any water, right? A ghost in the bathtub would not fill any space, but there would be a ghost in the bathtub. So God is mysteriously omnipresent, ever-present, but takes no space and is causing you to exist and everything in this world and universe to exist right now. Now somebody out there is thinking, as we're kind of scratching our heads, thinking, isn't this impossibly obtuse and philosophical, rather highfalutin? But to understand Christmas, we must at least begin to understand what we mean when we say the word God. Or we understand nothing at all. Which brings me to Christmas. Because Christmas is the stunning claim of the Christian faith that once in human ha history, in a certain time and place, when Emperor Augustus was reigning over the Roman Empire and when Quirinius was governor of Syria, the God who encompasses and sustains the universe, the source from which we all have our being entered into our world, taking human flesh, as an infant, as an embryo. That God is great is something that many people and many religions can affirm, or no religions of all. We look at the universe and say, God is great. You know, the, even the Muslim, our, our neighbors will say, Allah Akbar, you know, God is great. This is a faith that could be arrived at by just looking at the world and saying something great's behind this, but Christianity teaches a truth that we would not, could not imagine and it's the truth I proclaim to you. We couldn't reason our way to it. Christianity teaches this wonderful supernatural truth that God is small, that God is little, that God is weak. God enters the world armed only, only with goodness and grace. You know, if we were God, we'll all personalize that. If I were God, perish the thought, right? If I were God and going into the world, I'd come in like Rambo. I'd be both guns blazing. We're going to get all the evildoers and all the bad guys and shoot them down. I'd seek to set this world aright, and I would in the process destroy it. But in the plan of God, this plain little package, God breaks in into what Dallas Willard calls a divine conspiracy. He breaks in quietly, ever so silently, to die for us. This evening I preached not only Christ born, but I preached Christ crucified. The babe cradled in the arms of the Blessed Mother was born to die. A cross hangs over the manger reflected in the eyes of this beautiful child. He was born to fulfill the purpose of God, the purpose from the creation of the universe. And the scientists say, oh, 13 or 14 billion years ago, give or take a few hundred million, I guess. He came to die for us so that the world would be filled with wonder. Here's the wonder of it all. The weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. The smallness of God is mightier than all of our big plans. The mercy of God is greater than our sin and the life of God is greater than our death. And this is the wonderful mystery I proclaim to you. And you've heard it all before, but I am really, really blessed to have this wonderful vocation, this great privilege to say it again. And I hope we never weary of hearing the wonder that Christ is born for you and for me and for people everywhere, born to die and rise again for you 
for us. And when we start to believe it, when that gets through that crusty old sinner and we begin to whisper a quiet amen, it could be, good God, I believe it's true. Something wonderful happens. We begin to grow younger. <laughs> yeah, I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.